Eight, uh, State Government uh, Committee meeting for January the 9th. Uh, we're going to turn to uh, Ms. Robbins. Ms. Robbins, if you would, uh, would you please take the roll? Representatives Alexander, Beck, Bricken, Here. Carr, Here. Carringer, Here. Chisholm, Here. Cooper, Halford, Here. Helton, Holsclaw, Halsey, Here. Jernigan, Johnson, Here. Littleton, Marsh, Here. Moon, Here. Powell, Here. Wendell, Vice Chairman Eldridge, Here. Chairman Keesling? Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And again, th uh, welcome committee, uh, committee members and guests uh, here in the audience. And for those of you who are live streaming, thank you for being with us today. Committee members, we're going to turn to you. I uh, recognize any of you that, that may have any personal orders, uh, announcements. Any? I see none. So, let us let us begin if there's uh oh wait a minute yeah let us begin by saying this and just as a reminder to all you sports fans out there tomorrow we begin the TWA's uh girls state basketball tournament down at Murfreesboro and uh, some of you all may want to take just a moment to wish your uh, local teams, any of that may have some uh, teams playing in that in the big dance, and I know that uh, Chairman Hawford is raising his hand, and I know why that he is, because uh, looking at the record of all the girls uh, teams that are starting tomorrow uh, in Class A, that is, it is yes, it is Gibson County with the winningest record to date. So with that, Chairman Hawford, you are recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe uh, Gibson County Special School District is 27-1 and one so <laughs> far this year. And uh, this would be, if we uh, can do this again, I believe it'll be two times in a row again that we have won that tournament. So uh, uh, go Pioneers. Go <laughs> All right. Very good. Anyone else that would like to do some well wishes to their team. Well, I do. I want to recognize Clay County. They're uh, they're coming up at 10 a.m. in the morning, and they're playing against a school by the name of Peabody. Uh, also, uh, although not in our district, certainly uh, in our neighboring district, John, uh, representing Wendell's district, Clark Range, with a record of 27-5, they're, uh, they're going to be playing uh, at 4 p.m. tomorrow. So anyway, that's uh, that's great. We're We're – Yes, yes, uh, you're recognized, Chairman Hall. Mr. Chairman, I'm probably the luckiest guy here. I have uh, two teams from my district in, in the uh, state tournament. The other one would be Trenton Special School District. So uh, go Trenton. Yeah, go Trenton. You got it. All right, very good. This day in history, we have a couple of items that may be of interest to you. We're in back, take you back to 1987. The Irish rock band U2 released the Joshua Tree album. That album went on to sell 25 million copies. And today we are celebrating the 10th year anniversary of the end of the flights of the space shuttle Discovery. Over 27 years and 39 flights, the craft served as the single most used ship in the history of of NASA's space shuttle program. So, this day in history. Let us begin. We're going to, uh, now let's turn our attention, members, to item number one, and that's House Bill 1052. And we are going to, yes, we're going to recognize Leader, Leader Johnson. Is that right? Yes, I'm sorry, our Speaker Johnson. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 1052 is a housekeeping bill. When Speaker Sexton was reelected in January, he decided to make some changes to the committee system. Motion. Got a motion and a second. Uh, if you want to, you, you may continue, Speaker. This bill just puts it into code, Mr. Chairman. Judiciary committee becomes civil justice and or criminal justice committees 
education committees become education administration and or education instruction committees. Okay, very good. You have heard an explanation of the bill. Are there any questions to the sponsor? Any discussion? Uh, do I see any objections to me calling the question? I see none. So in that case, let us vote. Uh, those in favor of House Bill 1052, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. And uh, you have been very successful, Speaker. And you can let the Speaker know, Speaker, that he can, uh, that this mo is moving on. House Bill 52 is moving on. To, I think the calendar and rules, is that correct? All right, Mr. Analyst. All right, very good. And thank you, sir. All right. Item number two, House Bill 557. And that is by Speaker Marsh. Speaker Marsh, you, sir, are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Got a motion and a second. And we got a second. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. This uh, bill speak. was brought to us by the Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission. This will allow for a simple and safe transfer option of alcoholic inventory upon a closure or sale of a current TABC licensed establishment. Currently, on-premise and retail food stores are not able to transfer their inventory when they close or sell their business. Retail package stores can transfer, but the process is not streamlined. This bill will, will grant the ability to transfer leftover alcohol to a new owner if they sell their business or transfer leftover alcohol to another establishment they own of the same license type if the, if the closure is, is a, if they're closed the existing business. This will only apply to closure transfers and nothing else. This bill will allow the transfer to be done through a one-step process while allowing the ABC to have advance notice. This bill requires a 10-day advance notice to the ABC Department and the Department of Revenue on all inventory transfers. With that, I'll answer any questions. All right. Thank, thank you, Speaker. You've heard, uh, members, you've heard an uh, explanation of the bill. We do have a, uh, remind you, we do have a motion and a second. Any questions to the bill's sponsor at this time? We, uh, we've had a call for the question. Uh, is there any objections to the calling of that question, I see none. So, though, let us vote. Those in favor of uh, moving House Bill uh, 557 on to calendar and rules, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, lock sign. The ayes have it. And uh, congratulations, Speaker March. You're moving on. All right, let us move on to item number three i see uh leader uh, our leader lambert that's uh, up there in the bullpen and he's getting ready to toss out that first ball here with uh house bill 742 so uh that uh, we're going to recognize you <laughs> leader lambert if you would please thank you mr chairman and, and i have a motion and a second i think do i not yes i do you may proceed sir Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Always, always good to be in your committee. Now we, we've got an amendment. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Leader, Chairman. Leader, can you can you bring us in the loop there on uh, about that amendment tracking code, please? Yes, sir. Amendment it's coded four four seven six, and it rewrites the bill. That is correct. Uh, tracking code four four seven six. We do have a motion. Uh, we have a motion on the amendment. Do I have a second? Got a second. Okay, with that. Proceed, if you would, ex uh, give us an explanation of that amendment, Leader. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, last week after the testimony in the subcommittee, and I, and I appreciate all the work that went into this, um, it became pretty clear that a lot of our wineries are definitely utilizing fulfillment centers. And so many of you have probably heard from them. I certainly heard from them. And they are using fulfillment centers. So the original bill would have completely banned fulfillment centers. It would have said, look, if you're a winery, you have to ship your own wine. You, you can't ship anybody else's. You can't go through a fulfillment center. You just can't do that. So after hearing from many folks, um, this would simply license the fulfillment centers. They would pay a fee. They would be licensed. They would be under the umbrella of ABC. And they would have to, you know, be 
you know, monitored just like any other entity out there that is distributing alcohol. Um, it would allow them to continue doing what they are doing now, and it would allow them to continue to operate in Tennessee and, quite frankly, to ship wines in from other states um, to our state. It would allow, in my interpretation and in discussing uh, with folks that monitor this on a daily basis, it would still allow our wineries in Tennessee to continue to do everything they're doing now. Now, I know there has been some discussion kind of uh, behind the scenes on some still have some questions on that. I've checked with legal. I've checked with the folks that monitor this every day. I mean, this bill allows for every Tennessee winery to continue to ship their own products. Now, they couldn't ship somebody else's. So if you're making wine here in Tennessee and you want to ship a bottle of Barefoot wine or whatever brand, you know, any big commercial brand out there, you can only ship your own wine. Um, and if there are wineries that have multiple owners, they could still ship their wine. But again, this the biggest change of this amendment, it is allows for those fulfillment centers to move forward and for every winery to continue utilizing them. Very good explanation on the amendment. Now, we again, we are on the amendment. We have a motion and a second. And now we're going to recognize Chairman Husley on the amendment, sir. You're recognized. Thank you. With the, with the amendment, I was just going to ask, is, is this over a tax issue? I, I could never find an answer on who's driving the train here. Is it Department of Revenue that it's over a tax issue to cause for, for licensing? Leader Lambert, you're recognized. So it's me driving the train. Um, what it, years ago, I was in favor of our Tennessee wineries being able to ship their own wine. We had never, never done that before. We had never allowed them in an online setting to ship an intoxicating beverage. I mean, wine is not something that... Um, you probably think about it as folks that are underage abusing or of, of being a product that needs to be heavily regulated to, to ensure that the quality of that product is being met. But it is an intoxicating beverage. And so that has always been something that I know you and I both kind of monitor pretty closely. I mean, we have a very um, strict regiment of how alcohol in general is distributed in this state. And we've always stuck to that for safety reasons. So when we allowed our Tennessee wineries to be able to ship wine um, and, and sell that online and ship that through the mail, it was begun under the theory that they would ship their own wine and that they would be doing it. Well, unbeknownst to us, there were fulfillment centers out there that can handle that for them. They can ship their wine to that fulfillment center. They can warehouse it for them. They can you know, ship that all out for them. I didn't know about that when we passed the bill allowing for Tennessee wineries to do that, but it is an industry out there that has grown up around that. So when I filed the bill, it was to do away with fulfillment centers because, again, unlicensed, completely outside of our, um, I mean, really all of our protocols that keep folks safe. Well, again, when we started hearing from our wineries and from customers across the state, there's just simply too many people that use these fulfillment centers. So it's it's not a tax issue. It's it's really a licensing issue and a safety issue where if you're going to use a fulfillment center, it needs to be licensed and it needs to uh, allow for <clears throat> the same inspections and everything else that every other distributor would be subject to, um, to just make sure this is being done properly. So it, it, we've come a long way from the original bill, um, but it's, it's where I felt like the people of Tennessee wanted to be. And, and I hope that you guys will join me in support of this bill just to make sure that they are licensed. Chairman Halsey, uh, back to you, sir. Any further questions? All right. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, Representative Beck, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you, Leader. Uh, thank you. We had this in sub last week, and um, it was a very healthy discussion. Looks like you've done a lot of work on it. Appreciate that. But I'm still concerned with our uh, Tennessee wineries. I've heard no one's come to me, but I've heard that they're not on board with this amendment. Is there anybody here that could speak to that? Leader, you're recognized. I, I don't mind saying that there are definitely wineries that still have some concerns about this. Um, and it deals with kind of one vendor that they utilize for their shipping. Um, I'm still open ears on that. But I mean, I've talked to the ABC. I've, I've talked to the attorneys that drafted this. And I want to be very clear for the legislative intent on this because it, it says it in black and white. And this deals directly with their wineries. And I'm, I'm just going to read Section B, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman. It says, a winery direct shipper meeting the requirements of the section may make sales and delivery wine by common carrier to the citizens of the state over the age of 21 who have purchased the wine directly from the winery shipper subject to the limitations and requirements imposed by this section provided that a winery direct shipper may only ship wine <coughs> sold under a brand name owned by a licensed owned or licensed to the winery which is either produced by the winery including manufactured in a manner authorized under the current state law 
produced exclusively for the winery under an existing written contract with the winery, so what they're doing right now, or produced and bottled exclusively for the winery. I don't know any other way to make that crystal clear. If you're a winery and you want to ship your wine, you absolutely can do so. And this amendment allows for them to use fulfillment centers. Now, again, there is one vendor out there that is still has some concerns. And again, as always, I mean, I'm listening and open to those concerns, but I cannot figure out why. And you're an attorney as well. I mean, that language is crystal clear. If you're a Tennessee winery and you're shipping your own product, you can do so. And we, and it's not just my opinion on it. It says it right there in the bill. Representative Beck. Yes. We, I remember, I recall from our discussion last week, uh, we talked about, we, we had a uh, speaker who talked about uh, Vino uh, shippers mm -hmm. to help them with the paperwork, but didn't actually take possession of the wine. I, it, I would think from, this, from your testimony and from th reading this agreement, that if they're using that vino shipper now, they can continue to use that vino shipper. Is that is that the case? Later, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, I don't know the folks of that particular company, and I, I know you and I both and all of us stay away from trying to write legislation either for or against any one particular vendor. That that vendor would have to be licensed like a fulfillment center, the best that I can understand. And we allow for the licensure of fulfillment centers for them to pay a fee. I mean, it's a couple hundred dollars and be able to still fulfill that responsibility that they have decided to do for the wineries. So there is nothing that anybody has brought to me to indicate why Vino Shipper specifically. And, and again, I hate to call out one company, but it seems to be the only company out there that still says there are lots of other fulfillment centers that have looked at this and said, yes, we can operate just fine under this. And we're appreciative that we changed the bill to allow for that. That's the one company that has said they still have some issues. I'm still trying to figure out what those are. And I, and I do not believe that they are well-founded. I mean, it, it sounds like, again, I can only give my opinion. They simply don't want to be licensed. And I don't mind. You need to be a licensed entity. We need to know and make sure you're doing it properly. Representative Beck. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do we have anybody here who could, uh, from the Tennessee wineries, that could uh, clarify what their position is on this amendment? Representative Beck, I was going to uh, make mention to you as well as the other uh, the membership that there has not been, uh, of course, our committee uh, has a, a pr procedure that we, for our notice, we have not received within the past 24 a request. Uh, for testimony, and and for that reason, um, there will there will be no uh, allowance of that today. So, uh, but anyway, I wanted to pass that on to you. Okay. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, again, Representative Beck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, your understanding is that the only hang up, as we stand here today, is is this one particular. Uh, f uh, shipper or fulfillment house or whatever however you want to. Uh, term them uh, that the Tennessee wineries use that they're not wanting to come into compliance under your bill. Is that what I'm Leader hearing Lambert. say? Yes, sir. That's the only objection I know of at this juncture is that one particular vendor. And there are Tennessee wineries that use that vendor. And again, I, I want to be clear. It is not my intention of this bill. And I do not think the language of this bill prohibits them to be able to fulfill their responsibilities as a fulfillment house. The only hang up would be is if somehow they want to be treated different than any other fulfillment house and not be licensed. I mean, we're requiring everybody to, to play by the same rules. I mean, it you ship your wine and if you're using a fulfillment house, they just have to be licensed. I, I don't think that's too much to ask, but we are requiring that everybody play by the same set of rules. We're not making like an exception for one particular vendor. Reps, any back? So uh, we've, we've um, dealt with all their concerns except for this one point. Mm -hmm. And in and your statement to the, the committee is that's over one vendor. Is that correct? Uh, later. Yes, sir. It's my understanding. It's it's one vendor that has several wineries that utilize them. So, I mean, again, but it's just one vendor is the only one that I left that I know of. And I'm not, again, I don't understand even what their objection is because the plain language of this says you can use a fulfillment center. They just have to be licensed. And we've come an enormous distance from even last week in sub to say no fulfillment centers, period. We're not going to utilize those to say, no, nope, it's fine. We get it. A lot of our wineries, both in Tennessee and out of, use them. You just have to be licensed. Representative Beck. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Chairman. You're very welcome, sir. Now, as a reminder, members, we still are on 
amendment is your question. If you wanna, shall we wait until we get this on the bill? It's up to you, sir. I'll just wait to get it on. Certainly. Further questions uh, to the sponsor on the Yes, we do. Absolutely. Chairman Moon, you're, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and leader. There's more to product or vents of taxes. Leader, leader Lambert. Chairman, I am so very, and I've said this before in this room, if you've been at this podium, you will know when the heating and air unit is on, it is ridiculously <laughs> difficult to hear. It may just be my ears, but I am so sorry I couldn't hear the question. That's perfectly all right. Again, you're recognized, uh, Chairman Moon. Thank you, Mr. S Mr. Chairman. Leader Lambeth, for the record, requiring a license for the fulfillment centers who are acting like a warehouse, there are other obligations other than just paying a fee. There's care, custody, and control of the product, meaning the quality, uh, remittance of fees to revenue. Is, is that correct, or am I, is my thinking unsound? Leader Lambert. The requirements are under Section 4, Subsection B, you re I mean, it's a fee, but again, just like we would with any other distributor, you have there are certain reports that you would have to file with the ABC, with, you know, with ABC who these alcohol for us. Um, you know, tell them who you're shipping for. Um, make sure it's only going to folks that are over 21. I mean, most of the stuff that they should be doing now, or at least in the testimony from last week, they were already doing now. They know exactly who they ship for, to. It's always somebody that's over 21. But all that's listed in Section B and is is nothing that would be overly burdensome. Uh, Chairman, you're thank you, recognized. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Leader, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very welcome. Further questions to the bill sponsor on the amendment? I see none. We, uh, we get a call. I see objections to calling then on the question. I see none. Those in favor? In favor of amendment one, please say aye. Those opposed like sign. The ayes have it. And now we are back on the bill as amended. Leader Lambert, we are now at this time going to recognize Speaker Marsh. Speaker Marsh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Leader Lambert, I was not on the uh, subcommittee, so I didn't get to hear a lot of the testimony and everything that was said last week. I'm just trying to understand uh, what was wrong with the system that we previously had? Was it about not getting the proper taxes or was it underage shipment, uh, underage people getting the, you know, I just don't understand what was wrong with what we're doing now. Leader Lambert, you reckon? Yeah. Absolutely. And fair question. I mean, so the entire time you and I have been in the general assembly and, and you for longer than I, I mean, we have a very strict system of how alcohol is distributed in this state. And we, we went around that by allowing our wineries to be able to ship direct, which is fine. And we did that as a policy. When you have an unlicensed fulfillment, fulfillment house out there, and there was lots of testimony back and forth on that, the ABC really has no idea what they're doing. Um, they don't, I mean, you know, they don't know what those fulfillment houses are doing. They don't know who they're shipping to. They don't know how much they're shipping to. And you really don't know from a compliance standpoint whether or not they're shipping the product that we set in code that they're allowed to ship or if they're shipping something else. Because again, it's it's all online. It's all completely around the ABC. And that's that's what some of the testimony was last week is you really, you, you hope that they would be paying the proper taxes. You hope they wouldn't be shipping to underage folks. You hope that they would be only shipping the products that we've allowed them to ship in code. But we have no idea what's in those boxes unless they're actually licensed like your other distributors. I mean, if you're going to act like a distributor, you, you got to at least be licensed like one. So that's the issue that we're trying to resolve. Again, my first instinct was to just say, look, you shouldn't be able to use a fulfillment house. But upon hearing from our wineries and, and, and consumers, they're, they're simply too embedded in the way that they do this now. Had we thought of that on the front end, we probably could have said, look, you, you can't use fulfillment houses. You have to use someone licensed or just ship your own product. But some of the testimony, not to belabor it too much, but you asked kind of what had come out last week, some of the testimony from smaller wineries is that their volume's just not high enough for them to keep up with all of the different regulations in different states, the different taxes in different states, the different packaging that they need to do. So they find it to be more helpful to use fulfillment houses. So after that testimony, we changed it to say they could continue to do it, but it brings them into the fold so that the ABC can at least oversee their operations and make sure they're doing it right. That's that's what we're trying to resolve. Speaker Marsh. Okay, very good. Further questions? Yes, we do. Chairman Carr, you're recognized, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Leader, uh, you know, I said last week, I've got 16 wineries up in my county, and I've heard from them this morning, and uh, they still have a little concern on this. And of course, we it, uh, it came out of the a subcommittee last week, and I, I figure it will come out maybe today too, but is there still room, uh, if we get back and talk, we need to get back together with these wineries and see if we can work this issue out before, uh, I mean, because I got a call today, and, and the issue is this vino, I think, with what they were talking with me. So, uh, you know, I, I want us to continue to work on this, if it's at all possible, because we need to get this settled, because not only do I have 16 small wineries, and so well, a couple big ones and some small ones, but I'm fixing to have about four more in the county. And of course, they'll start out little, so they needed their help. So maybe just an agreement if we could... Do get together with this one because it goes, I think, to the GovOps that we can still try to work on this if it, at all possible. Leader, all eyes back to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and by the way, uh, you didn't know this this last week until I told you, but thank you for hosting my family and I in your, in your district this week. Left behind quite a bit of tax revenue in your district. If you haven't been to Pigeon Forge, uh, they, they are able to uh, relieve you as, as much money as possible while you were there. Yeah. So you have several wineries. We saw them in passing, but it really is a, a wonderful community. Um, I, I am open to any idea. Again, the goal of this is exactly what I have said. Now, I would ask that you support this today through this committee, and I would guarantee this committee that any any tweaks would only be to make sure that we're not excluding anybody and that our Tennessee wineries are taken care of. If there is some small change or something that would still be in the spirit of what this committee hopefully would approve today, I am open ears for that. I do not want any vendor to be excluded that, that's being a fulfillment center. I want them to all be included. If there's some verbiage or, or word that we're using that excludes them, absolutely. I have no objection to that. And, and you know, I'm all ears. Um, but I, it needs to be the, I mean, if this committee approves this today, and again, I would ask for your support on it, it needs to stay pretty much like it is. I mean, where they're going to be licensed and official and we know who's doing, you know, the fulfillment responsibilities. But if there is something that'll help our local Tennessee wineries or there's something to make sure that nobody's excluded, I am absolutely open to that. Back to you, Chairman Carr. Thank you, Mr. Leader. And of course that's that's my concern too. You know, I understand about the fulfillment houses and licensing and everything and make everything run smooth. But I appreciate that candor and I appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman Carr. And now we are going to recognize Representative Cooper. Representative Cooper, you're recognized. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Lambert. Are you talking to a person, uh, a business when you call these centers? What do you call these centers? Uh, uh, Leader, you're up. Mr. So Representative Cooper, I'm always wondering if I'm in trouble when you're asking me questions. I shall make sure I haven't done anything wrong today. The fulfillment centers are businesses, and they handle kind of shipping and logistics for some of our Tennessee wineries. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Representative Cooper. Being Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And did I hear you say that all of the centers are at their businesses, and they're all paying taxes? Leader. Well, we, we don't know um, because right now they're unlicensed. And so we don't know who is actually fulfilling this responsibility and who is actually um, who all the fulfillment centers are. I mean, they're, they're completely unlicensed at this juncture. There are no regulations that really cover them. And so that's what this bill does. It just makes sure that we know who the fulfillment centers are. They're licensed. They're regulated like any other distributor or, you know, anyone that's involved in kind of the alcohol industry. Pretty much all of them are licensed. This just makes sure that these fulfillment centers are as well. Representative Cooper, Mr. further questions? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. How much did I hear you say how much they're paying as fees mm -hmm. or the, that they will be paying? Later, Lambert. So in deal in, in many times millions of dollars in, you know, kind of gross receipts in and out. I mean, you know, there many of them are very large companies. So the only thing we have is a $300 application fee and then a $750 fee per year. That's all they pay. And for a business, again, those are relatively modest fees. $750. 750 a year. That's an year. annual fee. So you pay the $300 up front for the registration, basically. And then it's $750 a year. That's for the whole business. Representative Cooper, further questions? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. So that would be a total of $1,400 yearly, annually. Could Later. No, ma'am, just $750 annually. Annually. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Representative Lambert. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're very welcome. 
Chairman Wendell, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, I want to direct my question, I guess, to the sponsor, or maybe to uh, Representative Carr. Could someone articulate how this has a negative impact on a small individual winery? I mean, Representative Carr, you, you articulated it to some degree, but would somebody clear up for this committee? Because I don't think it's been explained yet. Why is somebody that owns a winery in Jamestown, Tennessee, sitting 20 feet from me? I and mean, she's a small business person. What is the issue that they're not happy with? Hang on. Uh, at the request of uh, Rep Representative Wendell, I'm sorry. We'll have to direct that question later to you, if you would, please. Hey, Representative, if you don't mind if I answer it, I mean, I, sure. I hate to put Representative Carr on the spot. If he wants to answer it, I'm, I'll get out of the way. But, I mean, I've talked with all these folks, and I think I can answer it. And if I don't no, satisfy the concern, no, I can yield no, to my he, good friend from... No, you're operating in good faith. I'm, I'm, I okay. certainly trust what your answer is. I just don't know. I, I'd yeah. like to know exactly what the issue is because apparently somebody thinks there's an issue. Later, you may recognize. So, I, look, this is simple. Our Tennessee wineries just won't help in shipping their product. That's it. We allowed them to be able to ship their product, to be able to sell it online and be able to ship it directly to retailers. So instead of having to go through the three-tiered system and all that kind of stuff, get it you know, out there through the kind of typical retail location, we allowed a couple of years ago our Tennessee wineries to help them out to be able to ship their own product. And again, the logistics and the warehousing of that, that's all they want. They just want to be able to utilize somebody else to do the logistics and warehousing. So again, the very first bill, absolutely could understand the objection that there are folks that use fulfillment houses right now much more deeply embedded in the system than even I realized. And we've come so far, it's really at this point probably impossible to say you just can't use fulfillment centers. So we amended it and said, okay, you're already using them. That's what you're relying upon for your, your shipping and your licensing. Um, again, I, I made some comments in the sub. I still think that that may be a mistake for many of our wineries to kind of turn over their whole customer list and their you know, a huge part of their business to a third party. But that's if that's what they want to do, this amendment allows them to do it. But again, there is one question from one vendor that handles fulfillment duties that has some of our wineries that use that vendor. They still have questions to make sure they're within this. I believe that they are. Right now, their lawyers are saying, no, we, we think there's still a tweak that might make sure we're in here. And again, I've, I've dedicated, if there's some tiny tweak that makes sure everybody's on the same playing field, I don't mind. It's just what I'm asking this committee to approve today, hopefully, would be that we have fulfillment centers licensed and regulated like anybody else that's, that's shipping and distributing alcohol. Representative Wendell, uh, and, and you can continue in just a moment, but but let me let me go ahead and say to to you and, and, the, and the bill sponsor and and the remainder of the committee. We do have uh, Representative Thomas, or Representative, excuse me, Russell, uh, Mr. Thomas from ABC that uh, has requested testimony. Now we've had we've had some good questions, a lot of good uh, lineup of questioning, but uh, just an FYI, he is forthcoming. We're gonna go out of session in just a couple of minutes here to allow uh, Director Thomas to to speak with us, but please continue, Rep uh, Chairman Wendell. Go proceed. This one follow up, and I'm not trying to be contentious. I'm, I'm just trying to learn. Does your bill allow a businesswoman who owns a winery in Tennessee to ship her product directly to the consumer, or does this create a two tiered system where she has to use a third party to? Uh, Later, Lambert. Oh, no, absolutely she can ship it directly to the consumer. In fact, that's what I would prefer. Again, I don't like a third party being in between. I mean, that, that third party is what creates the problem and has created the issue here to the, to the question earlier. The preference would be for every winery to ship directly to their customers. But again, that ship appears to have sailed that a, a large portion of our wineries are simply using a third party at their choice. And there's nothing in this amendment that requires them to use the third party. Um, and in fact, again, the preference would be for them to ship their own product to their customers. But I, it's my understanding that a lot of them use these other fulfillment centers. Chairman Wendell. This one final question, and I sure. don't want to belabor the point. What is it that the small wineries have requested to be included in this legislation that is not included? What, what is it that's going to yeah. make all these people happy that are maybe here today? One, again, 
20 feet from where I'm sitting who I work for, what is it that's going to make them satisfied with this bill that if it could be amended? Later, later, Lambert. So I've spent the better part of probably six weeks um, trying to get to that exact question. And it is still, there is again, still one question with one vendor. I mean, we've taken care of 99.9%. I, you know, I hate to let perfect be the enemy of good, but in working with the ABC, and I, I apologize, Mr. Chairman, I didn't know they were going to testify. That it's much more knowledgeable than I am on this area, so I would have not have attempted to answer most of these questions that I know we were going to have testimony. But, I mean, we've come so far in this to make sure that they can use a fulfillment center. There just appears to be one fulfillment center that the only response that I saw was they didn't, they didn't want to be licensed or have any regulations. And to me, from a public policy standpoint, that's just not acceptable. I mean, making everybody play by the same rules is a good thing to create that even playing field where the free market takes over. Thanks for your patience, Chairman Mr. Wendell. Chairman, thanks for your patience response. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Chairman Wendell. And next we have Speaker Johnson. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Leader, uh, what are the percentages of wineries in the state that use fulfillment centers? Do you know? Leader? Great question. They're unlicensed and unregulated. We have no idea. So the ABC has run some numbers and tried to figure out that very question. We had some testimony in the subcommittee on an estimate. Um, if I have just a moment. Later. And by their best estimate, over half. I mean, so somewhere between 50 to 60 percent is what they estimate. But again, nobody's submitting like, you know, a list of customers or a list of product that's being shipped because they're unlicensed. I hate to just sound like a broken record. So we really don't know. But that's the best estimate the ABC can come up with. Speaker Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Leader, are, are all these fulfillment centers located in the state? Leader. None of them are. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if they're out of state, I'm sure they handle product from other states. Mm -hmm. Leader. Are, are other states requiring a license? Yes, sir. Some do, some don't. Um, but yes, I mean, it's kind of a mixed bag. Speaker. So I, th I think the uh, physical note, if I read it right, correct me if I'm wrong, will increase revenues by $3,600. Is that correct? Thir I mean, 3000 Leader Lambert. Is yes. So if we have to audit one of these fulfillment centers out of state with what this is going to generate, I don't see how we're going to pay for it. Later. So again, the audit would be more on what is submitted. I mean, it, it would be a rare occasion if you're asking for like an on-site audit. Right. You know, the I think what ABC is setting up is that if if you're shipping out, I mean, you know, the, the paperwork is there. Everything's computerized nowadays anyways. Um, it's more of just them submitting that report to ABC saying, hey, this is what we shipped. This is who we shipped it for. Everything matches up. I mean, it's a lot like we do with a lot of other agencies where there's very little on-site inspection that happens with most of this. It's just, again, making sure the product they're shipping is what they're supposed to be shipping. And this bill would be for us to do on-site inspections and somewhere else that's really not needed. It would just be a matter of having the books submitted so that they actually are doing what they're supposed to do. Now, hypothetically, if you, I don't know, I had some indication that there was a criminal enterprise afoot and like there was a need to dig digger in deeper into it, they could work with local law enforcement somewhere and do that, but that'd be a pretty rare occasion. Most of this is just going to be submitted on the spreadsheets. Speaker Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Mr. Leader, will this bill, as amended, negatively affect our local wineries in any way? And will, will they be prevented from doing business if this bill passes, it will, will it prevent them from doing business the way they're doing business today? Leader Lambert. No, it will not. There is one fulfillment center. There is one vendor that is the only exception to that. Now, 
If they still wanted to use that vendor and that vendor said, hey, somehow or another, the language of this is tripping them up, then they might have to swap to the fulfillment center. But there's nothing in this bill that prevents them from shipping their own wine and doing exactly what they're doing now. It literally, the only hang up that I could even find at this juncture is with one vendor, one fulfillment center or one fulfillment house that is saying that somehow they don't they don't fit within this. And it's my understanding it's a fulfillment center that that actually just helps with the logistics. Um, so, I, I mean, my interpretation is they're clearly control, contained within this. But again, the legislative intent is this for, is for not any Tennessee winery to have to change what they're doing even one tiny bit. We want them to be able to use this and continue doing business exactly the way they're doing it. And for those that are out of state too, quite frankly, because we have consumers that have reached out, probably to many of y'all, that have said, look, we want to continue to get you know, the wine that we're ordering from Napa Valley. This allows for that. That's what this amendment does. Speaker Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Litter, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very welcome, sir. Now, at this point in time, if there's no objections, we're going to go out of we're going to go out of session. And uh, Mr. Thomas, if you would, uh, will you uh, quickly make your way on up now? And and to you, uh, Thomas, you have, uh, and I hope you've taken notes back there during these past thirty minutes that we've been on this, and and try to avoid some redundancy. And, and I'm, I'm saying that very in a friendly manner, uh, trying to uh, try to address a, as much as you can over the next five minutes. Hope you can do a wrap in five. With that, you know, the, you know the routine. Please identify yourself for the record, please, sir. Thank you, Chairman Keesling. My name is Russell Thomas. I'm the executive director of the Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission. I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to um, give, give a summary and a little bit of historical context about this area of alcohol law that we're dealing with and address a little bit the bill as amended. That I, and it may pick up on some of the questions that have been asked. Um, sell and ship directly to consumers in Tennessee. And since then, the marketplace has evolved in a couple of different ways that was that were unforeseen at the time that original law was passed, and um, it is really I would submit those two significant and unforeseen developments in the marketplace that we have today versus what was anticipated ten years ago that this bill really addresses. And those two major changes that we're making here deal with, uh, as Leader Lamberth said, one. Um, defining what wines may be sold by a license holder direct to consumers in Tennessee. And um, two, it creates a license for businesses known as fulfillment houses. So th the two ways the market has evolved over the last decade um, that were unforeseen when this were first passed. First, we have seen the rise of uh, a small number of online retailers that have obtained winery direct shipper licenses, and under the current law, they can do so, but they are not simply a winery that makes wine and sells their own wine. They have developed a very large online retail presence where they are selling sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of different types of wine. Um, the intent of the original bill, I've spent a lot of time going back and rewatching and listening to the legislative record over the years, um, always discusses an ability, a creation of a license for a winery to, to have an ability to sell their products uh, to Tennesseans and ship them directly to Tennesseans. There, was, there, there doesn't appear ever an intent in the legislative record to rate, create a license um, and this is a version of a winery license, a manufacturing license to go into the retail business, go into the business where you buy other alcohol products from other companies and resell this. But the way the statutes were drafted, um, one, a company can obtain a winery direct shippers license if they have a winery, but they're not currently limited to selling only the wines that they produce. So that's what the first major change in the law does. And as the leader mentioned, this amendment contains some language that makes it clear that any wine produced under the Tennessee winery license um, can be sold under this bill. Second major change deals with these fulfillment houses. So 10 years ago, um, 
uh, there was a consumer demand to allow this. People would travel, say, to California, for instance, visit wineries, want to be able to purchase wines, get them shipped to their homes. Maybe they weren't available uh, here in Tennessee or for other reasons. And the expectation was that, you know, we would expect those shipments to come from that winery's address and be shipped to an address in Tennessee. Well, over the years, um, we have seen wineries increasingly use third parties to assist in that shipment. And we've heard those referred to as fulfillment houses and some other states and bodies you'll hear it referred to as logistics shippers. They have grown so much that today they ship over six over 60% of the volume of alcohol into the state. So we have these unlicensed third parties that are having a large role in the majority of wine shipped into the state. And that's kind of the context of this bill. Thank you, Director. Appreciate that. You have heard. Any questions? Yes, we do. Chairman Hostlaw, you're recognized. Thank you, two, Chairman. Two and Representative Thomas, or... Director Thomas. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Director, for giving them that testimony. The one thing that we noticed that you kind of hit on a little bit is all those people or wineries or fulfillment houses shipping all these bottled wine in that was not traceable or trackable. And we, with this legislation, we'll be able to have a report sent to ABC to audit, correct? Director. Uh, yes, Chairman Holscall, thank you for that question. Um, we are desperate for more data to be able to track this, and this will create a system that by licensing this major player in the process and requiring them to submit periodic reports, we can use technology to take that new vast amount of information we will have and be able to process it in a way to much more easily identify legal versus illegal shipments into the state. Chairman, Chairman Oskar. And then the other thing, as far as we looked at, you know, as far as the money generated, I think it was just licenses. So if we have this traceability on all this usage or gallonage coming in, that taxes too will generate a lot of revenue too. Director. Yes, uh, we should be able to come in here with much more confidence and say, this is the amount of alcohol that has come into the state. This is the percentage by license holders and our uh, counterparts at the Department of Revenue should be able to report on the taxes received pursuant to that. Further questions, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, you're very welcome. Next we have Chairman Brick, and you're, you're recognized, sir. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Russell, for being here. Uh, and I, I certainly, I, I think we got the bill in the right shape. The one thing that came out of subcommittee, and I certainly just would like to be on record, in, uh, is the documentation of direct home shipments and verification of age. I think there's a, I think it came out that we have a problem and I would like to see your department recommend some clear action that we could legislate on verification of direct shipments at home that that we can address maybe at the next session unless I don't know if there might be a still bill moving current session but I'm not aware of it but I think we really have a problem in unverified home shipments. Director Thomas. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you for um, thank you for that question, and uh, that is something we'd be more than happy to look at and continue to talk about, um, and would like to talk about more. Very good. Further questions, uh, Chairman Bricken? No further questions to Chairman Halford. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and just in uh, uh, in case this might ha happen, if uh, X Y Z um, House decides they are not going to play. They're not, we're not going to get a license. We're just not going to do it. We're, we're going to keep shifting wine in it to see what are the consequences. Director? So uh, if this bill were to pass um, under current law and some additional tools, if this bill were to pass, uh, we would have some tools to, to leverage. Um, number one, we could uh, we would be able to identify which 
wineries were using that house and we could take action on their license, uh, fine, suspend, revoke their license, which would pressure that fulfillment center to comply. Uh, we could, uh, we would of course uh, ask or demand that they cease and desist such illegal activity. Um, we would request that the common carriers, FedEx and UPS, we would compile an investigative report and send it to them. And we would ask that they stop shipping into the state um, from addresses associated with that fulfillment, with that fulfillment house. And those, um, those would be um, the, the first and primary steps we would take in that situation. Chair, Chairman Hoffer, but, further but questions? They, they never applied for or got a license. So how do you keep up with them then? Director. Well, uh, well uh, hopefully, uh, if the, the quickest and most powerful solution will be if FedEx and UPS turn off their ability to ship into Tennessee, that stops the problem. And they have done so with some individual wrongdoers over the past year for us. I guess, I guess what I'm still trying to say is how do you identify that person that that's not playing by the rules? Oh, so so this information, these reports we've talked about will be coupled with reports that we already received that we started receiving a couple years ago from common carriers. So for the last two years, FedEx and UPS, any common carriers that ship alcohol into Tennessee, submit periodic reports to us. And we start there in that list all the shipments identified as containing alcohol into the state and then subtract the legal shipments, the, the information about the legal shipments that we'll receive from these reports. And then the remaining shipments will be deemed uh, suspicious or illegal. Chairman Thank Hoffer. You, Mr. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you, Speaker. Marsh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Russell, thanks for being here today. And I know we, you mentioned or someone mentioned earlier about if you're visiting Napa Valley, California, and you go to several wineries and uh, you like a lot of these wines. So you you maybe join a wine club and you want wine from three different wineries shipped into you. Can they, this fulfillment center, put those in all three different winery bottles in one box and ship it in? Or they got to be in three separate boxes or? How would that work? Director? Um, they would have to comply with, with the law, and that would require, in the reporting requirements, they're going to have to be able to identify which shipments come from which w licensed winery that they work with. So uh, off the top of my head and at the spur of the moment, I would think that they would probably need to devise a way where they are able to do that with their shipments and they may need to send the different wineries in different boxes. Um, Speaker. Speaker Mark. Okay. Uh, in, in your own words, what do our wineries have a concern about in this, the way that we're coming up with this legislation? What is their main concern? Director Thomas, in your words. Well, I, I certainly don't want to um, presume that I can perfectly articulate all their concerns, but I know that they have initially, they initially raised some concerns that some of the language at the beginning of the bill w might prevent the types of wines that they can sell. Um, I think the language in the bill as amended by including language such as the leader Lambeth pointed out uh, any wine produced pursuant to the Tennessee winery license can be can be sold in this manner. Um, that that should alleviate their concerns. Uh, as we look at the bill, and as we as I think about what products would this limit, uh, I, I believe the language is sufficient to to ensure that they can continue to current to sell what they can currently sell under the under the Tennessee law. Thank you. Speaker Marsh, further Thank questions? You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank You're you. very welcome, sir. And and now it's on to Representative Beck. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think that the, the previous questions had pretty well answered my question my particular questions and concern. But I do want to uh 
take a second to concur with uh, Representative Bricken on um, there's been wine left on my porch that I didn't order uh, without any signatures and um, it, it is a, it is a grave concern. Uh, so we we do need to uh, make sure uh, that these carriers are um, getting uh, identification and getting someone to sign and not just leaving it uh, where anybody who comes home from school early or whatever can find it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. And that, that is something we take very seriously. And that specific one would be in violation of the statute. And it is something that we actively cite license holders for violating. Thank, thank you, Director Thomas. Further question. Thank you, Representative Beck. Uh, we do. Yes, Speaker Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Director, it, it, under present law and the way it's being done now, if a local winery is selling through a fulfill, f fulfillment center, who collects the taxes? Director. The, the winery license holder. Or, or it submits the taxes. The Department of Revenue collects the taxes. Speaker Johnson. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank, thank you, Speaker. Any further questions to Director Thomas? It's been a fulfilling time with you, <laughs> Representative Thomas. Thank you for your patience and uh, and and well answered questions we appreciate you and most of all thank you for your service to this great state thank you sir thank you you Chairman are Kisling. excused and we will go we're going to go back into session and with that on the bill we have chairman Hoseclaw uh to uh leader lambert you're oh okay uh he passes so next we have uh representative alexander you're recognized have you requested? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So are we ready for the, or the question? Can I hear a, a uh, okay, no, we're, we're going, we'll wait. Uh, leader, you, you're requesting attention there. So go right ahead. Sir. Mr. Chairman, I'm so sorry. I, I promised somebody I would mention something that came out of the subcommittee. Uh, there was a question as to whether or not a common carrier asked for a signature. And I was told by FedEx that, and they wanted me to put this on the record, that they absolutely do. They said they can't speak for all common carriers, but they were following this committee and the subcommittee, and they wanted folks to know that FedEx, which is a Tennessee company, they said, look, we are never going to deliver any kind of alcoholic product without a signature. And they said they have top-notch, um, you know, processes in place. And that came up last week, so I promised them I would mention that. Uh, so if they're tuned in today, we can tell them I mentioned it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize. You're, interesting. you're very welcome. Chair, uh, Chairman Brickett, you're, t uh, you're recognized. Would you get a similar statement uh, from UPS? Leader? Well, I will say that particular company does not have quite the footprint in Tennessee uh, that the previous one I mentioned, but it would be nice to know from other common carriers if they do that, because we had an anecdote uh, by one of our members shared last week that somebody had not gotten a signature on a product they had delivered. So i uh, Again, I can only speak for one of them, but Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to get that out there. I should have said that Certainly. in the beginning. I promised him I would. All right. For, okay. I see uh, we've got uh, – I did see a call uh, for the question. So here's where we are, committee. This has been a very colorful bill, hasn't it? A lot of questions, a lot of Q&A, a lot of Q&A. The, the chair is going to call, and we're going to uh, draw our attention to Ms. Robbins, and we're going to go down. We're going The chair is calling for a roll call vote. So with that, Ms. Robbins, would you proceed, please? Representatives Alexander? Yes. Beck? Yes. Bricken? Yes. Carr? No. Carringer? Yes. Chisholm? Yes. Cooper? Yes. Halford? Yes. Helton? Yes. Holesclaw? Yes. Holsey? Yes. Jernigan? Yes. Johnson? Littleton, yes. 
Marsh? Yes. Moon? Yes. Powell? Yes. Wendell? No. Vice Chairman Eldridge? Yes. Chairman Keesling? No. Chairman, you have 17... 17 ayes and three no's. All right, you have heard, you have heard the uh, results of the voting 17 versus three. We, we now declare that House bill as amended, 742 passes, and it now, uh, Leader Lambert moves on to Gov Ops, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and I'm sorry for taking up so much of your time today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we will continue back. We'll focus back on our calendar. We'll go to item number four. And leader, who is going to... Oh, there we are. We, uh, we're we going to recognize... That's House Bill 760... Uh, excuse me, 769. I see no amendments to that. Uh, Chairman Reagan, you are recognized. I got a motion already on you, sir. Do I have a second? We do. We have a second to you, sir. You're, uh, would you please explain your bill yes thank you mr chairman and it's an honor to be here especially after that lengthy debate the last time this is a one-line bill <laughs> all it does is change the requirement uh to be a uh veteran service officer in our state from being a combat veteran to just being a veteran okay we got all right we've already got a oh, got a question on the bill however we're going to recognize chairman moon chairman moon Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, sp sponsor an honorably discharged veteran. You are correct, sir. 58-3-106, subparagraph A, specifies honorably discharged, honorably discharged veteran. veteran. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further questions to the bill sponsor? Got a question on the bill. So I see no objections. Let us vote. Those in favor of House Bill 769, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like, sign the ayes. Have it. And we uh, congratulations to you, Chairman Reagan, on the passage of House Bill 769. It is now going on to calendar and rules, sir. Thank you, committee. And Mr. Chair. <laughs> You're very welcome. House Bill number five. That's, uh, excuse me, item number five, House Bill 851. And uh, we are going to recognize our dear chairman, Chairman Crawford, with House Bill again, as I say, 851. Uh, we've already got a motion and a second. We do. Uh, chairman Crawford, you're recognized, thank sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, committee. I think I've spoke to everyone on the on the committee about this bill, except uh, Representative Cooper and Representative Eldridge, who I couldn't find last night. But uh, anyway, um, this is a good bill. Of course, ever everybody comes up here and says that. But basically, uh, I think most of you are aware of, but I was not aware of. Apparently, people can come and put a lien on your property or your home or your your business. And this is happening throughout the country, but it's happening in the state of Tennessee. And you not know about the lien and the time go by and you could actually lose your house and the police could be on your doorstep saying, get your stuff out because it no longer belongs to you. I think one of our representatives here actually had a friend that this happened to. So the Registers Deeds Association brought this bill to me and basically they have software now that they're implementing throughout the state with all the registers departments that you as a citizen uh, can go online and register with them. So if anybody places a lien on your property, whether it's legal or illegal, it will alert you that that lien has been placed there and that way you can go and, and deal with it. What my bill does, that's going to go into place whether this bill passes or not. They're going to do that. What my bill does, it says when you go online to register, you have to put your personal information in there, social security, address, phone number, those type things. My bill would exclude, exclude that from the open, uh, open Meeting Act to where they can access that. It would keep your information private. That's what my bill does, sir. Well, well explained. First, uh, any questions to the bill sponsor? Uh, we have a we have called for the question, and I see no objections to calling the question. Let us vote. Those in favor? of House Bill 851, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like, sign the ayes, have it. 
And uh, House Bill 851 has passed, and it is moving on to calendar and rules. Chairman Crawford, thank you for this. Thank you, sir. Thank whoa, you, committee. Whoa, whoa, hold it. I'm sorry. Correction. I've been told I'm wrong. It's GovOps, Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yes, committee. Sir. Thank you. Our dear Chairman Zachary is up next with item number six. His bill number is... 1046 and we've already got a motion i heard a second wow you are a uh, wow you're ready to go sounds like almost thank chairman zachary yes you're recognized sir, sir. thank you mr Proceed. chairman thank you uh members house bill 1046 will look very familiar to this committee it passed unanimously out of this committee last year unfortunately the senate was not in the same posture uh this is a bill related to no bid contracts simply requiring those no bid contracts to come before fiscal review i have to take any questions all right, you've heard an explanation of the bill. Any questions to the sponsor? Got a question. The question has been called. So let us vote. Those in favor, I see no objections. So those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, locks on the ayes have it. And you, uh, congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Zachary, Committee. and yes, I am correct this time. You're on to calendar and rules, sir. Thank you. Item number seven, House Bill 442 by Chairman Vaughn. Chairman Vaughn, get up to the podium there, and we are uh, delighted to have you today, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Today, uh, hopefully this committee will have the opportunity to write wrong. This is our bill which allows service members' families to request the appropriate burial time if they are killed in action or killed in training for active duty military in our state. Hard to believe we have to bring this bill to codify it due to poor decision making on uh, former members of the administration. But I understand. I understand. Here we are. We got. Thank you, sir. We have a motion already in a second. So any questions to the sponsor? I see none. We got a yes. I heard a call for the question. I see no objections. So therefore, let us vote for House Bill 442. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign the ayes. Have it and congratulations, Thank Chairman you, sir. Vaughn. You're headed to Finance, Ways, and Means, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Item number eight. By yes, we already have a motion, Doc Ramsey, and a second. I think we already hear. I see no, I see no uh, amendments there. So, Chairman Ramsey, you're recognized, sir, on House Bill three seventy seven. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. This this bill is a a correction bill for code uh, brought to me from the Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission back in two thousand sixteen. Uh, the state had a requirement that uh, anybody uh, asking for a package store license uh, had to have been a resident of the state for two years, uh, that uh, uh, we had somebody apply for that and and uh, turned down. They didn't have the residency, so they came back and, and attempted to sue the state. At that time, the uh, uh, question about the constitutionality was adjudicated and uh, from that period of time, the uh, ABC has not uh, enforced that regulation. And then in 2019, the Supreme Court did determine that that was unconstitutional. So we uh, are at this point taking it out of code. Very good. Good explanation. And I did hear a question. Did I not I call for the question? And I see no objections. Therefore, let us vote on House Bill 377. Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, like sign the ayes, have it. And Chairman Ramsey, your bill 377 is headed to calendar and rules. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great afternoon, sir. We are now on to item number nine. And as uh, we are happy to have Chairman Hawk with us today, he is bringing to us House Bill 220, no amendments. Chairman Hawk, it's good to have you in the in, behind that podium. Good to see you, sir. It's great to be here, Chairman Kiesling and members. Thank you. House Bill 220 uh, will 
give the Davy Crockett Statue Commission, which was enacted in 2012, a uh, suggestion as to where we think the location of the Davy Crockett Statue should be. That's got what it. the bill All does. Right. You got a motion already and a second. Questions to the bill sponsor? See, now I got a question. I see no objections to the calling of the question. Therefore, let us vote House Bill 220. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, like sign the ayes. Have it. And Chairman Hawk, you are going to be carrying that one right on up to calendar and rules, sir. Congrats. Thank you, Chairman Members. Sir. Next, we have item number 10. This is House Joint Resolution number 8. And we've got a motion, Chairman Todd, and already a second for you, sir. Would you uh, would you explain your House Joint Resolution, please? And by the way, allow me, Chairman, if I may, and I'm sorry to interrupt. We do have uh, members. We have uh, uh, two. We have uh, two testimonies forthcoming here. But uh, Chairman, we will go ahead and uh, uh, allow you to provide us to give you the you give us the overview, and then we'll. Uh, we'll go out of session then for testimony. So please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This resolution calls for, it's an application to the U.S. Congress to call them to provide an Article 5 convention, uh, a, a, a article provided by Article 5 of the Constitution of the United States of America, call a convention limited to proposing an amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America to set the, a limit to the number of terms to which a person may be elected as a member of the United States House of Representatives and to set a limit on the number of terms to which a person may be elected as a member of the United States Senate. I've had some folks comment on this proposal that uh, why don't the states just do that themselves? Why don't why doesn't Tennessee just set a limit on their congressional de delegation? But 1995 Supreme Court ruling said that we couldn't do that. Congress has provided our founders provided in the Constitution for this manner in which for the citizens of the United States and it's the, the states in particular to call for a meeting of delegates from the states to actually propose amendments and that's all this is for. It would call for uh, once 34 states pass a resolution like this, then Congress would have this request before them, and the Constitution says they shall set a time and a place for the meeting of those delegates for one purpose, that is to propose amendments to this back to the states to be ratified. And that's what this does. I would appreciate questions if uh, if any have before we go out of session, if we can do that, sir. All right. Now, he, uh, our, our sponsor has entertained any questions prior to going out of session. Uh, and, and do we have any at this point in time? If not, if there's no objections, then sponsor, we will, we are going to go out of, of session. And I think you, we're going to allow you to bring your, uh, we have Aaron, uh, du duquette i hope i pronounced that where is aaron where are you aaron please be making your way on up here sir now uh just just a note as aaron comes on up we're going to uh we you know I, we're all looking at the clock this will probably well i don't know how this is going to work out we're, we'll give you five minutes aaron but we're going to stop watch you just like your uh, uh the uh person who's going to be coming up following you sir so, uh, for the record, if you will, uh, your uh, your your name, sir, and the clock is is rolling. Get engage your mic. I don't think it's on. Is it down there? No, there it is. There you go. Scoot it on up. Bring it on up a little closer. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Proceed. Thank Thank you, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of the committee. My name is Aaron Duquette, and I'm with U.S. Term Limits. I'm here to testify for a measure to allow the states to come together to propose term limits for members of Congress. Pursuant to Article 5 in the U.S. Constitution, whenever 34 state legislatures pass a resolution called an application notifying Congress of their intention to convene the states to propose an amendment on an agreed-upon topic, Congress is obliged to call an amendments proposal convention where that topic is discussed and a proposal can be put forth for ratification by three-fourths of the states. House Joint Resolution 8 would have Tennessee call for a term limits convention to cap the number of terms any member of Congress would be permitted to serve. 
allow me to take a moment and clear uh, the, a, a misunderstanding that we see of the framers with the Constitution. Opponents often employ a straw man argument fallacy to attack a resolution like this. They claim that there hasn't been such a convention called uh, since the Philadelphia Federal Convention of 1787. This is a straw man argument because uh, if you read the text of Article 5 itself, it states clearly that the, it authorizes a convention for proposing amendments, which must be ratified by three-fourths of the states to become a part of this constitution. So note the, uh, the use of a demonstrative pronoun, this, making clear that proposed amendments once ratified by the states become part of this, this same constitution. So there's no mention of a new constitution or wholesale revision of the present constitution. Secondly, an Article 5 convention has never been called. The reason is that two-thirds of the states have not agreed upon a topic for a convention at a given time. Over 400 such applications on a wide range of subjects, from a balanced budget to slavery to a bill of rights to presidential term limits, have been passed by the states in our nation's history, yet no such convention has been called. It is limited to the scope of the call, otherwise we've had several conventions by now. Simply put, an Article 5 convention is different from a constitutional convention, like an eagle is different from a penguin. Both are birds, surely, but at the end of the day, a penguin is just not free to do what an eagle can do. An Article 5 convention for proposing amendments and a constitutional convention are both interstate conventions, but an Article 5 convention is limited to amendment proposals by subject matter and under the authority of the existing constitution, and a constitutional convention has open plenary power derived not from the existing constitution, but from the residual sovereignty of the states. <clears throat> uh, just further, you know, uh, uh, point to you as well. Uh, James Madison defended the notion that the uh, the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia ran away. Uh, he addressed that in Federalist 40, and I've uh, emailed you as well um, that information. I come before you on behalf of 78% of Tennessee voters who want term limits on Congress, including voters from all political affiliations and demographic categories. Tennesseans know that Congress is long past being responsive to the needs of the country. And what is good for the presidency is good for Congress. The incumbency advantage built up in D.C. is just far too strong for voters to really just vote them out. The re-election rate in Congress is 95%. I don't think I need to tell you it's not because they have been doing just such a bang-up job. It's because the voters don't have real choices and won't, so long as they, we don't have term limits to ensure open seat elections periodically. Big super PACs give out over nine out of every $10 to incumbents over challengers. High-powered lobbyists in D.C. abhor term limits because it un undercuts their profiting off of dec decades-long relationships with congressional lifers. The people, however, routinely say that they want term limits at around 80%. I'm here to stand with the people, not with D.C. It's time we finally put this common sense reform into place and cut off the gravy train of a runaway Congress which continues to pass the buck on important issues. Thank you very much, Chairman, and I encourage uh, any questions. You Certainly. Might. Thank you, and thank you for being respectful of our time. I appreciate that, working us in. Now, any questions to uh, Mr. Brigade? Of course we do. We, uh, Chairman Ho uh, Hofford, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't remember now what the number you gave us, the percentage of, of Tennesseans that were in favor of this. Was it 75% or something like that? 78% uh, of last, last so year. So 78% of Tennesseans are in favor of yet, mm -hmm. this, but yet they, they keep collect, uh, electing these people. So do you see a little irony there or something? Do you uh, see something? Mr. You can't? Sure. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. Uh, and the reason is because uh, we voters don't have real choices at the ballot box. The the incumbency advantage is so so strong in D.C. Uh, that it precludes uh, serious challengers many many times, and we don't have the kind of competition we ought to have in primaries. Uh, well, and so voters end up voting for the lesser of two evils very often. This Chairman Halford, this is thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is my seventh term. Mm -hmm. uh, that means I'll be here 14 years if I don't run again. Uh, last time I won with 83% 80, plus of the vote. Uh, I think that says that my constituents like what I do. Uh, I believe if I chose to run again that I would receive probably the same amount of, of vote again. So consequently, I guess what I'm coming to is I think, I think term limits, I'm term limited every two years. Uh, so if, if, if my constituents don't like what I'm doing, then they don't need to vote for me. 
Um, I guess I guess that's what I'm what I'm saying. I, I think it's I think it's the, my constituents' responsibility to do their homework and determine whether I'm doing my job or whether I'm not. So I guess it wasn't a question, Mr. Chairman. It was just a statement. So I appreciate that. Thank Certainly, you uh, I, we respect that. We understand. Any response to that? Oh, sure, and I would just say a couple of things. One is that it's sort of apples and oranges between the state level and uh, and D.C. D.C. is, is very different. Uh, the re-election rate, like I mentioned, is 95, 96% continually. In Tennessee, you have a part-time legislature. You all make, you know, you're paid, what, $19,000 a year you know, to do this part-time. You have your own jobs back at home. You live among the people that you serve. And if, you know, if we really said that elections are term limits, then I guess we would have to then, to be logically consistent, then want to repeal the 22nd Amendment, which gave us term limits on the presidency. Okay, thank you very much. We, uh, again, we were watching that clock. Uh, and members, we're going to have to move on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Duquette. We appreciate your time today. And thank now you, we, we're going to turn our attention to the rear of the room, Joanna Martin. We're going to ask you, if you would, to please come forward. And uh, as Mr. Duquette did, for the record, we're going to ask you to identify yourself. And uh, again, you, being respectful of our time, you know we're, all, <laughs> we're going to give you five minutes. Please, please keep us within five. You're recognized, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, Honorable Members, I'm a retired litigation attorney and speak in, as a citizen against HJR 8. Please ID yourself, please. Uh, Joanna Martin. Okay. We who oppose an Article 5 convention see the danger of a convention and are compelled to warn others. Our first constitution was the Articles of Confederation. There were defects in the Articles. So on February the 21st, 1787, the Continental Congress called a convention, quote, for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation, end quote. Well, we know what happened. Instead of proposing amendments to the Articles, the delegates proposed a new constitution with its own easier mode of ratification. That is our sole historical precedent for a convention called to address our federal constitution. James Madison was a delegate to that convention and kept a journal. His journal and his letters prove that our framers understood that the purpose of amendments is to correct defects in the Constitution, and the purpose of a convention is to get another Constitution. George Mason was a delegate to the convention. He hated the Constitution then being drafted. On August the 31st, 1787, he said he would sooner chop off his right hand than put it to the Constitution being drafted, and if it weren't changed, he wanted another convention. Madison's letters warned that people seeking to get rid of our Constitution would use getting amendments as a pretext for getting another convention where they could impose a new Constitution. That's what's going on today. The various applications for an Article 5 convention, term limits, BVA, free and fair elections, etc., are bait which appeal to different groups of people to get them to jump on the bandwagon for another convention where a new constitution is certain to be imposed. New constitutions are already prepared. Any new constitution has its own new mode of ratification. The proposed constitution for the new states of America is ratified by a referendum called by the president. This is why Madison, Alexander Hamilton, four U.S. Supreme Court justices, two conservatives and two liberals, and other legal scholars warn against a convention. You might ask, how can they propose a new constitution when Article 5 says the convention is to propose amendments? Here's the answer. 
The Declaration of Independence is the fundamental act of our founding and part of the organic law of our land. It recognizes the self-evident right of a people to throw off one government and set up a new one. That's the provision James Madison relied on in Federalist Paper Number 40. He invoked that right as justification for the delegates to the Federal Amendments Convention of 1787, ignoring their instructions to propose amendments and instead proposed a new constitution with a new mode of ratification. Delegates can do it again, but this time James Madison, Hamilton, Ben Franklin, and George Washington won't be there. Contrary to the assurances you have heard, heard. Once two-thirds of the state legislatures have applied for a convention and Congress sits about organizing it, the states have nothing more to do with the convention. The Constitution does not say the states select the delegates and control the convention. The April 2014 report of the Congressional Research Service shows that Congress understands that it has the power to determine the number and selection process for delegates. Congress has the power to select the delegates they can select themselves. You cannot avoid the danger with faithful delegate laws. Even if Congress permits states to select delegates, you can't get a conviction of delegates who exercise the self-evident right we exercised in 1787 when we threw off the Articles to Confederation and the delegates can always vote by secret ballot. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Martin. Boy, you're right on time. We appreciate that. <laughs> Dead even five minutes. You are an amazing lady there. Thank you. All right. Any questions to Mrs. Martin while she, we have her in front of us here? I see none. Ms. Martin, thank you so much for thank your time. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you're, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I know we. I know. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate. It. All right, we're we're going to go back into session. We're going to uh, turn our attention back to uh, you, uh, Chairman Todd. But uh, as you can see, we have Chairman Husley that has got a question for you or questioning. Go right ahead. You're recognized. Thank Chairman you, Mr. Husley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What's your rebuttal to? Um, the concerns that this lady brought. Chairman brought Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you for that question. There are several uh, that I have, but in the interest of time, I'm going to make a couple of primary ones. Okay. Um, Roger Sherman of Connecticut was a member of the original Constitutional Convention, and later he wrote that um, f this was following Article uh, uh, the adoption of the Constitution, and then he was regarding Article 5 in particular. All that is granted us by the fifth article is that whenever we shall think it necessary, we may propose amendments to this Constitution, not that we may propose to repeal the old and substitute a new one. It's strictly for proposing amendments. The argument has been that this, con this convention could do anything they want to. They could adopt a whole new con Constitution. They could do anything they want to. My counter to that would be on a state level. We have 95 counties in this state. You know what the county's roles are. This legislature set the counties in place and keeps them in place. They exist at the will of this legislature. If 72 of those counties, three-fourths of those counties got together and said, you know something, we're going to meet and we're going to propose a new law for the state of Tennessee because we don't like XYZ law. So we're going to propose a new law. And, and that 72, which were three-quarters of the counties of the state of Tennessee, decided they had, at this meeting, they have now proposed and passed a new law. Is it any more of a law than if any one of them singly had passed that? I would say no. It is not a law because the Constitution we live under in the state of Tennessee, Tennessee does not allow counties to pass state laws. It allows this body to pass state laws. Neither does the U.S. Constitution allow for a meeting of delegates to pass anything other than propose an amendment. That's all it does, and that must be ratified. We live under this Constitution right now. We all take an oath to uphold this Constitution, and that Constitution says the only way it can be changed is by ratification by 38 states as of the number right now. 
Uh, That's it. Chairman Hosley, we, we, we must move quickly. I'm, I'm done. I just to, that's the first time I've ever heard a difference between an Article 5 convention and a constitutional convention is that there's a different, that's a different thing. Well, the, the original constitutional convention was to form a constitution. That was their single purpose. Thank you. Both. Do I hear a, 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 a call for the question? Yes, we do. We have a call for the question. I see no objections, so therefore let us vote on uh, House Joint Resolution 8. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, like sign. We are going to pause in the action. We're going to do a, uh, the chair is calling for a roll call vote. Ms. Robbins, please. Representatives Alexander. Beck? No. Bricken? Yes. Carr? Yes. Carringer? Yes. Chisholm? Yes. Cooper? No. Halford? No. Helton? Yes. Holesclaw? Holsey? Jernigan? No. Johnson? Yes. Littleton? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Moon? Yes. Howell? No. Wendell? Yes. Yes. Wendell? Yes. Vice Chairman Eldridge? Chairman Keesling? Yes. One moment, please. Chairman Wendell. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you have 13 ayes, five noes. 13 ayes, five noes. Uh, the uh, House Joint Resolution 8 passes, and uh, we are moving on to what count? It, it does go to calendar and rules. Congratulations, Chairman Todd. Do I hear a... Uh, Entertainment. Now, wait a minute. Before we do that, though, I must add, those uh, the uh, this calendar, those relating on the calendar, will be uh, moved to next week's calendar. Right? Correctly? All right. Now, do I hear a motion to adjourn? We do have a motion to adjourn, and I hear a second. We have a second. Thank you all very much. We are adjourned.